during the great power Mongols had a rule of law. During great power Mongols had those ethical principles. They exercised those things because that was the, the best defense to advance their cause, also to keep that power intact. Today, best defense is openness. Best defense is transparency. Mongolia's commitment to international cooperation is strong. With the fall of communism, relations between Mongolia and Europe have again blossomed. Your financial, technical, and humanitarian assistance and cooperation greatly aided our effort to build a free democratic society. And for that, we are grateful for you. In the early 1920s, Mongolia came under communist rule, which lasted for seven decades. During Stalinist purges, one out of every six adult men was killed. More than 700 Buddhist temples were burned to ash. But they were not destined to win, not destined to last forever. At the end, in our will to live free, prevailed. That was a tough journey to embark upon. Mongolia's democratic revolution was totally peaceful. And since that day, a quarter century ago, we have transformed from a dictatorship to a democracy, from being one of the most isolated, closed communist regimes in the world to one of the most open. Dismantling the old regime is one thing, but the building new one is a real challenge. You can build institutions, you can have multi-party system, democratic elections, and uh, freedom of press, freedom of assembly, but uh, maintaining that, that's a real challenge. I think leader means you can lead the people, not to control them. How people are important, how people are powerful. If you give that notion to your people, you can make good progress. When I meet the people from Kyrgyzstan or from Myanmar, from North Korea, I usually tell them, you know, we had this kind of difficulties, we had a closed society, but we introduced, we gave more opportunities to our people. And we have this, we have this economic growth. You know, people usually take care for themselves better than any government or any politician intend to do for them. I usually say that we have herdsman society, more than 30% of our people is still pursuing nomadic way of life. Their means of life is their cattle, and we prioritize that cattle. People will take care of their property than the state, than the communism. And if you give more property to your people, your people will benefit, your, your country will be economically more great. I think give to your people that initiative. That will take many burdens from your shoulder as a government, as a leader. I think free society is a, is a society where challenge opportunities are together. Even you are president or you are ordinary citizen, you are learning together. In a free society, ordinary citizen and president will see challenges together. We never hide our shadow. If we made some mistake, if there is something bad going on, our people see it. I see Europe as an example. European Parliament is a premier invention for greater democracy. You know, most representative body in the world which uh, in human history created. And this is the most caring hearts of democracy. This is the great uh, institution for harmony, for peace, and for freedom. But it's unfortunate to see war in European continent. It should be a peaceful continent. It, it, it was a peaceful continent. It was like the best hope of the humanity 
for the peace, for the good things. And it was a shining example for us. But uh, what what happening in Ukraine, it's really unfortunate. And I was studied there and I have some experience. And because of that, I think the war should be stopped, must, must be stopped. For example, I met the foreign minister and the, the, there were the discussion, close discussion. And I, I, I was critical, you know, you guys, when, when, when you came to the power through the Orange Revolution, you did not really fully deliver good governance. You didn't fight corruption. You didn't deliver those great promises and those great expectations. The main cause was the bad governance, not putting enough effort to build those institutions, those institutions which, which are required in a decent societies. And they had to fight against corruption. They had to uh, bring rule of law, and they they had to uh, build those civil societies and gender equality. And those things should be there. My philosophy, my strategy, always: if you want to do someone doing good thing, you try to do yourself. And uh, for other countries, for example, for North Korea. Mongolia is pursuing for 23 years nuclear weapon-free zone status. And we are trying to show without nukes, you can be better engaged with the other people, with the, with the other countries, and without not endangering your neighbors or your uh, surroundings. And you can be better off, off from that. And also with the capital punishment, for example. I usually say that, of course, everyone can talk about human rights, democracy. But the greatest test, if that leader advancing that great cause and uh, also respecting the human dignity, human life, if that leader fights against capital punishment, fights for that uh, great cause for the human dignity, you are passing the test. I told the North Korean foreign minister that, Please tell to your, uh, to, to your leader, when a young person listens to the Western music, and after that, he or she captured and uh, executed, and that's not good. And uh, Mongolians, of course, we love freedom because uh, uh, we can make mistakes, and, but it will not cost our lives. There should be a question, does a state have a right to kill the people? Of course, they are bad guys, you know, committing bad crime, but does the state have that right? Before June 18, 2009, Mongolia was regarded by Amnesty International as one of the worst countries in terms of capital punishment. That was the day I took my oath to become president of Mongolia. That same day I saw on my desk two draft decrees. I had to make the choice on whether or not to have two men executed. I chose life and I kept my decision. There have been no executions in Mongolia since June 2009. Let me be clear, capital punishment is ineffective, barbaric. Under no circumstances is capital punishment acceptable. Mongolians say that uh, we never choose neighbors. And our neighbor is Russia and China. And uh, I think we have to be different from China. That's my philosophy, from Russia. Different in our governance style maybe different running the country. China is the biggest population, one of the fifth people living there. Russia, biggest land, they have the biggest land uh, mass in the world. Running those countries may be different, but uh, we respect, of course, the form of government and form of uh, running their countries. And we ask also, they respect our way of life. 
and they say they they respect it. And we have a philosophy that uh, if we give more power to our people, my country, my people will be better because we have three million people in comparison with China or in comparison with Russia. Uh, that's modest, modest figure. And we need to make people more powerful, people having more opportunities. They should have more opportunities to create. In order to exercise that, you have to give it to your people their right. You know, Mongolia always dependent one of our two neighbors. During communism, we were heavily dependent on Soviet Union. Mongolia was the satellite country of Soviet Union. Now, because of the rising power of China, uh, biggest uh, investor in Mongolia is China, biggest trading partner in Mongolia is China. Also, we know that dependency, heavily dependency on one country, on one neighbor, it has also created some challenge. And because of that, we have to balance that. In order to balance that, we, we, we pursue third neighbor, neighbor policy. And third neighbor policy means bringing more interest and more investment, more relations with the other countries worldwide. When we call third neighbor policy, we call European countries our third neighbor. European Union is our third neighbor. Asian countries our third neighbor. Australia and America and others our third neighbor. And we should benefit from that. We have to pursue proactive diplomacy. And because of the geographic location, landlockedness, we need some kind of, some means to connect with the rest of the world. That's the value. If we respect human rights, if we respect the rule of law, if we respect the openness, market economic principles, that makes us irrelevant to others and to Japan, to European Union, to North America, to all those countries. And, uh, and, and they see that we can have, with Mongolia, we can have business, business together, cooperation. In terms of investment, I usually say to our friends, to our partners, Mongolia has uh, something to pay back. If you invest in Mongolia in a proper way, I think you will get a return. You will have that. You know, we had a very successful economic roundtable with the United States of America. Our parliament has concluded transparency agreement. That's not only for the American uh, investors from America, that's for all investors actually applied. When you have open society, usually sometimes it takes more time to make decisions. Once you have that consensus, once your people and community is knowledgeable about that, once you have that, that kind of discussion with your people and with your investors, once you make that decision, the longevity of that decision is guaranteed. That's also one of the beauty of the open country. And we have really close relationship with Japan. We developed it and we got uh, one great agreement called the Free Trade Agreement, Economic Cooperation Agreement. That's the first agreement we made with the foreign government, that's Japan. And through that, uh, there will be more know-how coming from Japan, more technologies will come from Japan, and we will benefit from that. Mongolia will be a strategic anchor for the EU in the East, helping advance our shared values and interests for building peace, democracy, and engagement in Asia. Mongolia does not have an intention to lecture others about democracy, yet we do have lessons to share. With Kyrgyzstan, we are sharing our lessons learned in building effective parliamentary democracy and enacting legal reforms. With Afghanistan, we are conducting training for diplomats and public servants. With Myanmar, we are hosting media workers, journalists, 
and civil society members. With North Korea, we are engaging in economic security dialogues. We strongly believe Mongolia can make a substantial contribution to regional security in Northeast Asia and beyond. Keeping democracy, keeping freedom, that's really difficult. And balancing, in terms of the Mongolian case, is quite unique. Our surrounding and balancing that peace and also that peaceful development there. You have to have good relations with your neighbors. That's essential. You have to have good relations with the other countries. Also, you have to, you have to keep your spirit of freedom, your people's new choice for democracy. That balance is the art of the politics. Just a month ago, there was a visit, Prime Minister of India, Mr. Modi was in Mongolia, and we have a, a great uh, ancient, I may say, ancient connections between India and Mongolia, spiritual connections. And Mongolia is a Buddhist country, and we have that spiritual connection with India for a thousand years. That, that's a really great connection. And on that, we are also trying to build our modern new relations. And it really opened big door for us. Buddhism is uh, our national heritage. And uh, Mongolians actually brought many good things to Buddhism. People, great minds who were related with the Buddhism, they brought new teachings, new form of development. Even the Dalai Lama say that Buddhism is a most scientific religion. You know, that's uh, really suited, really based on science. And uh, I believe in that. And uh, Buddhism has a great potential to develop. And also Buddhism has a great potential to benefit the human community worldwide. And uh, that's, uh, that's really great. And uh, that makes Mongolia more richer. Of course, in relation with the Dalai Lama, and other, some, some leaders, we have uh, some challenges in our part of the world. When Dalai Lama comes to Mongolia, there is always a challenge. He never makes the political statement or something in Mongolia, but he's just uh, saying good things to their followers in Mongolia and teachings, how we should benefit from the Buddhist teachings, Buddhist ethical teachings, Buddhist humane teachings, Buddhist peaceful teachings. And those are the great, how to make that our society more coherent, more harmonious society. Also, religion has a great role to play. In that regard, we have to have our own policy in Mongolia. I see bright future of Mongolia, and I think in order to have bright future of Mongolia, you have to go through not illusioned way. There were many bumpy roads in Mongolia, but I hope there are more plain roads yeah, in front of us, and we are passing those bumpy roads. Those roads uh, had to fix, and we are fixing and doing that and putting our road uh, for, for our next generation to make us smooth, as pleasant for them. And that's our duty. And I really believe in our country's future in a peaceful and free way of life. When we ask our people about freedom, about democracy, most of them, uh, about 70%, 80% people say that democracy was a right choice to make. Freedom was a right choice uh, to make. Mongolia's made right choice. I say it one day with, with my friends, you know, even big house opened by the small key. If that key is suited, <laughs> you can open big house. <laughs> Means if, if there is very small flame, 
but that can shed big light, that can be seen from very far from the in darkness. If you are sitting in the darkness, there is small flame. You will see, Mongolia is playing like that, like that role in our region.